This is how legends are made. Legendary. There's so many legends in this building today. Legendary. Hi, everybody. I want to welcome you to Legendary I Lived It, the podcast. I am so excited for today. I love it when I'm able to interview my sons, my family, uh, people that I'm close to. And today, my son, Nick, is a part of our podcast. And you'll see, not only am I asking him questions, he turns the tables on me and starts interviewing me. So I, I'm on the hot seat occasionally here, but love my family, so proud of my family. Please welcome Nick Jonas. Well, today for Legends, we have someone truly special, and I am honored and thrilled to be able to interview my son, Nick Jonas. Nick, welcome. Your favorite son. It has been said, but I don't choose a favorite. <laughs> Your favorite son, Nick. I mean, I know Joe was on the podcast, but I'm your favorite, obviously. So, Well, you are and have been impossible to ignore throughout your whole life. You have... Uh, I think that's a compliment. Yes, it is a, a great compliment because <laughs> from the beginning... Ignore. Yeah. Just a headache. No. Just a headache. Never a headache. Your Always. little brother said when he was asked, like... Does Joe get punished? Yes. Does Kevin? Oh, yes. What about Nick? No, he's like Jesus. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, I try, but I'm I'm nowhere close to Jesus. But. No, but you are very talented and a wonderful son, and I'm very, very blessed. Um, well, I'm happy to be on the podcast. Thank you. Well, this podcast is interviewing legends and people that have had legendary moments. Mm -hmm. And I've had someone interview me. I don't consider myself a legend, but to talk about memories, to talk about life, to think about legendary things that have happened, funny and exciting and thrilling, but also to kind of treat it as a biography mm -hmm. and look at life. And, of course, I know you very well, but your perception on things as I've been preparing for us to sit down, I can't wait to ask you about your perception because I know my side of it. And we've talked often about there are all these sides and recollections to all of our stories. So uh, excited to talk to you about it. But uh, since we go way back. Yeah. Uh, to day one. To, to day one and even before. Uh, I, your mom and I talk all the time as we tell people about how talented you are, that we caught moments that were wonderful right away. But our recollection of you singing when you would wake up is special to us. But I would love to ask you, like, when do you remember that music and music coming out of you and that creating of music you would do when you'd wake up? Like, what is your recollection of that period of your life when you were really young and just starting to feel that drive and compulsion towards music? You know, it's kind of weird because I I, um, I don't remember the moment I first sang or, uh, you know, heard music or fell in love with music, but my memory is about uh, a bit of a rebellious streak uh, as it relates to music, and that was like jumping into the the pit that the drum kit was in mm -hmm. at CFNI, which is oh, the wow. Bible college that you taught at and went to and met mom and all that. But um, I went down there and I, I was like banging on the drums and I think it was two or three. Yeah. And that's my first music memory is, is not like, you know, doing it the right way, but just <laughs> playing and having fun, enjoying it. And, um, and being somewhere you were not supposed to be. Exactly. Uh, and I, I loved it. It was like, you know, magic moment and um from there i think you know the the first time i i remember singing was probably with you just in the house yeah you know at the piano and um but it really wasn't some profound thing it was just like you know always kind of around that was part of the culture that you and mom created uh, yeah. around all of us yeah you were surrounded by some great musicians but to that point i want to go back to the drums that's why I started with that question, because our memory is 
so emotional for us. We would wake up, and when you would wake up, we would hear this angelic high voice <laughs> travel through the house. It was so emotional because I was, I was waking up every day, far before you wanted to wake up, I'm sure. But Exactly. Yeah. But creating music. But I love that your perspective is so, like, opposite yeah. of where, what runs through our head and what runs through our mind as a memory. Well, it's, it, you know, I feel like a lot of things in my life are, are you know, a contrast to the person that I've, I've now become become uh things like that memory where you know the first sort of musical memory has something to do with being somewhere i wasn't supposed to be playing drums i wasn't supposed to be playing right and then like even you know swimming for instance my first memory is jumping over a fence and going swimming even though i didn't know how to swim and before by the way yeah. you were old enough to have climbed over a fence yeah and you figured it out and jumped in to the deep end of a pool I don't. I don't know why that is the reality because I'm. I'm pretty uh, by the book at this point in my life. But early on, I was. I was rebellious. I had a rebellious streak. No, you scared the bejeebies out of us. Like when you yeah. when you went over that fence, we thought, "Oh, we've lost our son." Well, and you, you know, learned how to swim. Fight or flight. That one. Yep. Well, that that's an interesting insight into so much of life you know we we honestly we, i feel like not to interrupt you but i feel like that's what shaped my uh songwriting process uh yeah. shaped my acting chops is just like diving in with no technical training yeah and just doing it reckless you know? abandon yeah i mean it's better to just do than to to sit around and you know be a student for too long i love oh, to I learn but I like to learn as I go, and I think that was part of it. Was whether it was the drums or swimming, whatever instinct yeah. drives, and and not the the you know uh, the learned way. Cool. What well, do you do that today? Still, where you? No, I'm much more fragile. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot more to lose. <laughs> if I'm being real. Yeah. Um, no, be no, real. I mean, relationally and and also career wise, I think I'm at a point where I'm I'm proud of. I described it this way to actually your son Franklin the other day because mm. he's obviously working on his album and Very uh, he was asking us about our new album. Kind of curious about the process and everything else. And I was like, look, Frank, you know, there there is a different process for every album mm -hmm. and uh, every creative process. And uh, no one way is the right way. You just have to go with what what's right. And you know, he was curious because we were such a, you know, we were so involved in every step of the process of our past albums, mm -hmm. from the songwriting process to producers, everything else. But with this one, we really leaned on John Bellion, Monsters and Strangers, and the team that helped build the album, which will be coming out next year. And I think, you know, my thing was, if you think about it from this perspective, this analogy, it's like, we built a cul-de-sac of homes, right? And each home is an album yeah. and we built it from the ground floor and uh, it, it, you know, built this beautiful neighborhood, but now a new architect has come in and said, I love what you did. Can I build my version of it? And that's John Bellion. Um, and it's brilliant. Well, thank you. I hope so. It, what he captured though, and, and I can't wait for people to hear it and I won't give anything away other than he got you. Yeah, I mean, he got us uh, creatively, vocally, um, and to answer a, a long-winded way of answering the question you asked before, or, or you feel like you're that way now, is no. Yeah. It's like much more fragile, but that's the freedom of trusting in a collaborator to say, okay, I feel like I'm too fragile with this. I don't know what to do. Can you mm. take the lead? And um, that's been the biggest area of growth in my creative life, I think. Wow. Do you think that has something to do with being married to Priyanka and lessons that are learned there that are part of marriage? Yeah, I think that, you know, uh, everything that I do right is because of her. <laughs> everything I've done right is <laughs> because of her. I do get that, by the yeah. way. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it, it's, it's truly that thing where, uh, you know, you become one with the person and mm -hmm. 
that extends beyond your relationship and the home that you build, but also into your creative life and business and everything else. Um, it's natural that at the end of a day, uh, in the same way that you and I met at our house, we'll sit and talk, you know, life and business and mm -hmm. just a part of the, the exchange that we have as family. Right. Um, and, and we both, I think, benefit from that uh, emotionally. And, and so with me and Pri, I, I think that, you know, there's definitely that connection where it's, it's every decision that's made business-wise, every uh, instinct uh, emotionally and creatively kind of run through that filter of that person that you trust and, and know has your back, but also uh, will say, I don't think that's the right thing. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe think about it from this angle and... Um, that's been invaluable. Well, it, it was for me. I, I, I have said often that my early parenting philosophy was turning to your mom and saying, what do I do now? Yeah, for sure. Because I didn't have the role model part of it. Uh, and so, yeah, she helped me. And because you hadn't changed a diaper. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the only diapers... <laughs> It's it's funny. To this day, I've only changed the diapers for my sons. Yeah. And even with my granddaughters, I'm like, mm, uh, mm. I love everything about it. Tell me where to go. Tell me what to do. But yeah. I, I just I don't know those, where to start. Those little humans can produce a lot. A lot of stink. Yeah. yeah. It stinks less when but it's, it's your good. Child. It's good. I love it. And it's there's great. a lot of truth in that. It's I crazy think, how you life. celebrate the. <laughs> those things well remember i'm a cancer survivor colon cancer yeah i celebrate that a lot mm. you must i must and i won't go into like puns related to no, that please don't no, no. no puns no <laughs> it's of, a pun part of my contract to do this podcast okay no, no puns it's a pun free zone although you started doing puns and dad jokes and i love it. i have yeah it was like the minute our daughter was born it just happened um, <laughs> it no, makes me I think so there, happy. There is, I think there is something, and I don't mean to pontificate here, but there's something that happens when uh, you have a child where you stop caring about mm -hmm. everything else. That's and so, so you know, it's like making a joke that's super stupid and all that. Like, you don't care. You're not trying to impress anybody because all you care about is the, the human being that you created. And that's I know so you know true. this, but... I know that's it. That's the freedom in parenthood. It's, it's like, the fr and and in grandparenting, I like. And also I when you don't look at baby like, talk to anybody. Yeah, and exactly. Y your daughter, the other daughters, I'm like, oh baby, do, do, do. like it changes, uh, and I don't care with anybody if they see it. Yeah, it's special. No facade, and your daughter, you know, she has me wrapped so hard around her finger that uh, she's got me. Perfect. She's, she's perfect. She's perfect. Well, I want, I want to go to another vivid memory of mine and see how it relates for you. But that early entrance into Broadway. Mm -hmm. There's so many stories that I've thought about. But specifically what happened when you went to Christmas Carol, the musical, yep. at the theater. And it was your first show, professional show. And what I've found as I get older is that it's not the crowd. It's not the accolades. It's, it's the heart part of all of these journeys that now really touch me. And what, what really captured my attention, and your mom and I spoke about it then, is when you joined those other kids that were Broadway kids. And a lot of them had credits and continue to have credits throughout their lives, still to this day. You found your tribe, mm -hmm. right? And that's yeah. the piece that I was thinking about. There was something about those kids. And when we spoke to the parents, they all had costumes in their basement. They all built they were all weird theater kids. We, yeah. yes. <laughs> well, I'm being nice about it. Of course. Because yeah, yeah. I'm a theater I, kid. I, I, I'm, I'm saying this from a place of love. Yes, of course. For all the theater kids listening, I love you. I'm just Yes, we, we both love you. The, the trope was there that they 
built yes. barricades and did a one man version of Les Mis. Um, here's the deal. I, I don't think that I was ever bullied in school. You know, I, I, I've thought about this a lot because I'm like, was I, was I made to feel outcast? And honestly, dad, probably. Like the reality is that I probably was, hmm. but I was so bullish about my passion for performing and music that it didn't matter. Whoo! Like and, I love that, and it was—it's bizarre to think back to the time I was in regular school because I was like, yeah, you know, I would I would say to you after, you know, for for context for all the people listening, when I started doing Broadway shows, uh, they the school let me come in late, mm-hmm. right, at 10 or 11 a.m. because right. I would be up till midnight each night performing. Um, so they let me come in late, and then Wednesdays they would give me off completely and just give me homework. Because you had the matinee. Because I had the matinee, which is a, a 1 p.m. show. Um, and so a lot of the kids would, would th- th- ask things like, and you know, I'm in second grade, like, <laughs> so you get paid to sing, like, and one could look at that as bullying, but I was just... I was so like passionate about the thing I was doing that right. it didn't matter what they kind of said or did, but I never felt outcast because I mm. felt so uh, so welcome by the community that I was in in you know the theater. Yeah. So whether that was the kids at a Christmas Carol or um, the other shows I was in, I connected mostly with the adults in the shows. That's true. And and. Uh, made friendships that have lasted me, you know, a long time. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's bizarre to think back and, and wonder how, you know, I didn't get made fun of more or if I was being made fun of, didn't allow it to affect me in that way. Um, but I, I think I chalk it up to the fact that I was just loving what I was doing and it didn't matter. Well, on a smaller stage, I understand that. Like, I, I grew up, as you know, Cotton Mill Village, family that was disadvantaged by any measurable point of context. Sure. <laughs> and and I've talked to people like I dated the prettiest girls in my high school. Flex. Flex. I did it, and they <laughs> loved it. Uh, <laughs> I dated the prettiest girls in the high school. All of them. <laughs> All my ex wives loved me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh. Well, but in that, I knew that, I, and, and I had a confidence that even though I wasn't the jock, I played sports, I wasn't great, I, I was disadvantaged, I couldn't afford to even date, I basically batted above my station, if you would. I, because I, of music. Because of music. The moral of the story is if you're listening to this and you're thinking... Sports or music? Yeah. Choose music. No. Choose music. <laughs> if it's about Kidding. intellect or music, choose music. Yeah. No, to I think all the, be... To all the sports folks out there, no, do that too. That's great. Do but, that too. And I kind of did everything. The, you did everything. the runway for musicians is... You know, it, it's, well... It's slightly better. <laughs> people like rock stars. Um, and, and even in a town like Belmont, which is my point, is like I had a self-esteem that others around me didn't have and a security and a dream for the future yeah. that impacted. I felt I had a purpose. Do you feel like you had that? Did you ever think, last night we're on stage, and I saw you have a moment where you're looking out and you're playing, and there's like a, a, a tear in your eye. Did you ever think this would happen? Like when you're looking at your, your sons? Never. At, you know, Two, five, and what is seven? Like, no. How wild. Oh, well, here's what I knew. I have those moments where I'm like, how did this? Yeah. Fooled him again. Fooled him again. <laughs> yes, that's what runs through my mind. I, I yeah. think there's no way. Yeah. However, I had such a benefit. I did what's, it. What's your proudest moment, though? Well, you're interviewing me. My proudest moment, I'll first say yours. And then the Jonas Brothers, because they are they are different. The pinch me moment for you, and with you related to you was you had me so often write a song on the way in, 
to the Broadway shows and finish it on the way back. And you were yeah. you were disciplined. Like Unless I was watching uh, Agent Cody Banks on your portable DVD player. Yes. I still and I was too distracted by that to write a song, but yes, the rest of Yes, it. but that did happen, and that's a deviation from the story, but yes, and I have an affinity for Cody because of Shout that. out Cody Banks. Shout out Cody Banks. Um, but when you were honored with the How David Award. That was cool. At the theater where you did Annie Get Your Gun, and you called me your hero. And we, you talked about the writing of the songs on the way there and back. Yeah. And the How David Award is the songwriting award that they give to up-and-coming when mm-hmm. they induct into the Hall of Fame. Uh, it, there's so many things about, you know, Lionel Richie was there. Other giants were there that impacted my life. And my son was being honored. And sitting behind me in my office is the award you allow me to steward during this yeah. time. I mean... Hands down, I'm, I love songwriting. I love music. I love your love of music. There was a backstory to the moment, and I get to look at that to remind myself. Hands down, dad flex. I'm going to need that award back, by the way. It's kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's in the right hands. It's yeah, where but it belongs. It's, I said, use the word steward. I, no way. That that is your award, but I just I look at it. It's our award. How about that? Let's get it. Let's get it. Let's get it. I love that. Jonas Brothers, Texas State Fair. Hmm. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> Wild day. It was more than good. Yeah. It was historic. And my favorite flex of that story was, you know, the helicopters like I thought the promoter was out of his mind and traffic was backed yeah. up to Oklahoma. That was a that was a flex and I had friends at that show that couldn't get there from West Texas. Yeah. Uh it was a, a lot of people. That was <laughs> that was the moment where I went there this has just caught flight and is a completely different thing. That was fun. What about you? What are your like moments where you look at it and go personally, but also professionally? Like this, this is it. Uh, personally, it's kind of two parts. I mean, one is kind of like seeing the the brothers come back together and, and rebuild. You know, that was yeah. that was bigger than I think even we realize mm-hmm. relationally separate career all that but like what that meant to us as family yeah um and the steps we took to do that it was it was a process well and i'll I'll say it didn't just do it for our family there was something about what happened there that sorry i get so emotional about it that helped families yeah realize like it carried some symbolic thing i think the documentary did a good job of kind of like no question part of it um and we were all pretty transparent. Yeah. So that's on the personal front. That's one. The other one is is obviously you know being a father and and fatherhood is magical and frightening and yeah. I feel like I have uh, gray hairs popping up that that I didn't expect to have popping up this early in my life. But that's what happens because you're you care so deeply and you know each moment matters so much and so yeah. Uh, your willingness and readiness and ability to be present and truly be present is so important. And I think that that's wow. the, the area of my life that I'm, I'm, you know, most proud of and, and know I need to do the most work on is just in continuing to be present um, yeah. for her as she grows. Uh, and then career wise, I don't know. There's a bunch of things that it's not even like accomplishments or accolades. It's, it's more like places yeah. that I've been or scenarios I've been in where I'm like, this is nuts. No one will believe this. Um, you know, the, the farewell party for the Obamas was, was one, which oh, is my yeah. dinner party story. And, um, it was, it was nuts. I mean, I, I don't want to go into the whole story, but it was just a really fun celebration of, 
what was an amazing eight years, what mm-hmm. represented something really special uh, about what I love about this country, um, and a family that I love and respect. And it was such an honor to be asked to come and celebrate with them as they said goodbye to the White a- House. As they arrived and said goodbye. Correct, yeah. I mean, President Obama greeted me at the door. <laughs> it was like... <laughs> You know, it was cleaning out the closets the other day for the girls, and we, we saw the guitar that you gave them when when we first moved in. Thank you so much for that. And it was like, you know, to cut to eight years later, I'm I'm there with them still. It was really special, and yeah. and uh, a scenario that like I recognize is insane to have been uh, invited and to be there, and it's only because of the career yeah. part, part of. And hopefully, because I'm... Well, that opened the door, but you were there. A fun party guest. Also, but, because uh, you're a fun party guest. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was a great time. Yeah, so that's one. And then, you know, um, I don't know. I think that these Vegas shows have been really fun. I've actually enjoyed the process of trying things. You know, yeah. for Broadway shows, right, they do like an out-of-town run. So it's like La Jolla in mm-hmm. San Diego, or they'll go to Chicago or uh, Boston. Charlotte. Charlotte. Um to, to try the show out of town for a while and then see you know how it translates and then hopefully bring it to the stage. Um, so I feel like this has been, in a lot of ways, our out-of-town run for next year and what's mm-hmm. coming next year. Just to literally get out there and try things and see what works, what doesn't. and It's magical. And, uh, you know, the fans are that are so anxious for new music, the way you have approached, like, giving them love in the playlist for these shows yeah different uh different set lists every night which is fun it's it's really been incredible and it should continue if there's a way to continue it yeah i mean it's it's bizarre because um i forget sometimes i'm like oh well look me in the eyes was not my set list (laughs) we're paranoid like (laughs) by the way raymond the co-writer was here Last night? Well, yeah, he was oh, here. No. because we didn't play it. <laughs> I was like, are you going to stay for when you look me in the eyes? I cut it. It's so <laughs> sad. Sorry. Sorry, Remy. Literally, so we cut three songs last night. And, you know, for everyone listening, we have what's called a talkback mic, which basically allows us to speak to the crew and the band on stage. The audience can't hear it. So in real time, I'm looking at the clock of the show. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at... Uh, the set list, the crowd, and kind of getting a feel. And I'll, like a, let's call it like a quarterback. That's like what came to mind. Making, that calls his own plays. Yeah, plays. And, yeah. and Kevin and Joe do the same. But we all like just kind of feel the vibe and look at the clock and make sure that we're either not running short or long. Yep. And last night we got through, I think halfway through the set, we're like, oh, damn, we're like done. Like way <laughs> over. <laughs> we're going to be here for two and a half hours if we keep keep going. But Yes, we cut, look me in the eyes, paranoid, something else. But tonight we're going to add it back in. So I don't know if he's here tonight. but No, he took off, but it's okay because... He still got paid for that song, so it's fine. He's, he's, <laughs> he did. Uh, we've both been paid for that song, and that, that's, that's good news. So as a son, I'll reverse it. What's your, like, son moment? Of uh, like, what nature? Like that... I have the the stories I tell about you. Yeah. What are the stories, funny or not? Uh, I have a good one, actually. <laughs> a very good story for this. Probably not what you were expecting, but I'm going to tell it. No, it's okay. It's so we, we were in uh, Jakarta, uh, and it was like towards the end of 2012, I want to say, like right when the brothers were about to break up. Right. So things were not going well. Uh, right. relationally that like the shows were not good. There was like, you know, a thousand people at a show of a 17,000 seat <laughs> arena papering. And it's just papering. Papering means giving the tickets away. It was really sad. It was, um, tough. and you were back in the U S and you were like urgent, the email, like you can do the thing where it says like urgent and it's got like two red, you know, uh, exclamation points. Uh huh. And you sent it to me, Joe, and Kevin. And I'm telling you, like, it was, I don't know, 1130 midnight our time, probably 10 a.m. your time. And we all, like, look at our email, like, stressed. Oh, what, what is this about? And the email said, 
urgent. What's your favorite Subway sandwich? <laughs> and we, we all, I want to pull the email. out. We all stopped and we're like, what? <laughs> What is, why, why does he want to know? Why is this urgent? In Jakarta. Um, You're not even in the U.S. Yeah. And, oh, that's and so, so funny. We like sit around like thinking, what could this be about? Like, is this a joke or is he, is he trolling us? Does he have a meeting with, with Subway? Yes. I guess you did have a meeting with Subway. And it was urgent that you knew what our favorite Subway sandwich was. So whether you know this or not, it became a thing in our friend group that uh, – it was the, the drunk test. If you can say, what's your favorite Subway sandwich, you're clear. You're not drunk. Oh because 10 gosh. people tried to say it and couldn't do it. <laughs> so for everyone listening, if you think your friend might be fucked up, just say, what's your favorite Subway sandwich, and make them repeat it. And uh, I guarantee you, <laughs> they, they will not be able to get through it. So oh. I have a... I have a, a a thought um, for your podcast here, which is that you should ask every guest at the end of your show, what's your favorite Subway sandwich? Done. And I'll, <laughs> t- I'll tell you mine right now. Uh, Italian BMT, double meat, lettuce, pickles, olives, oil and vinegar, oregano, done. Perfect sandwich. Perfect sandwich. Toast- me- toasted. Always toasted. And for me... Toasted Philly cheesesteak. Ooh, that's a good one. But only meat and cheese. But honestly, what's your favorite Subway sandwich? What's your favorite? I mean, you know what? I would do it. Every every show, if you're a guest on this show, yeah. you will be asked as the last question. The last question. Oh, that's so good. Here it is. Wait, but there's a backstory. Oh, wait. Urgent. What's your favorite? <laughs> I got it. This is from... 2012. 2012. There's a backstory. Okay. Well, the backstory, I was with Melinda Bell, if I remember this correctly. Mm-hmm. And. Shout out, Melinda Bell. Love you. And we were, I think, in Connecticut, and there was an opportunity, but because of several things, Subway really yeah. wanted to make sure, and I respect this as a brand, that it was authentic. Yeah, so they wanted to know what our favorite Subway sandwich was. You have to was. have a favorite. You you have to frequent their shop and actually have a favorite. And, of course, of course. we did. I, I, I'm <laughs> telling you, Italian BMT, double meat, lettuce, pickles, olives, oil and vinegar, oregano. But I sent that with no context. Urgent. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So Jerry Seinfeld, in the tribute to Paul McCartney at the White House, read some lyrics and said, well, she was just 17. Well, you know what I mean. Mm. And he went on to say, that Sir Paul. That did not age well. That did not age well. And he said, Sir Paul, what did you mean? Yeah. So we're going to do a segment going forward where we ask about some lyrics. Sure. And ask, what did what's you mean? Story? Yeah. yeah. What's the backstory? So, Black Keys. I want to go to Black Keys. Let's do it. And in Black Keys, which is a very somber, amazing song. Kind of sad song. Yeah. Sad song. By the way, one of my favorites. The song is... We're playing it tonight. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Awesome. But you wrote this. She hits the gas, hoping it will pass. Yeah. What exactly did you mean? What do you think I meant? Um, yeah, so I, you know, I wrote this song at our house in Bel Air at the time on the Yamaha piano that's been in the family for a long time. And it kind of like came out of me pretty quickly. I think it was like 20 minutes. It it came out of you. Is that a pun? No, no, no. It's it's (laughs) not intended if it was. Um, but I, I wrote the song, got to the studio, laid it down with John Fields, the producer, and he called out that lyric he's like that's funny is that like an inside he's like what are you talking about he's like oh you know the, the gas hoping it would pass it's, it's funny especially because the song is so emotional i was like oh yeah, it's just true you know i was so in my like, <laughs> artist moment i was like it's just true like this is what happened right um and he's like well who's it about i was like well, i'm not gonna 
tell you, but it, it <clears throat> you know, there was some gas and it did pass <laughs> in the car. And it was important to put it in the song. Wait, so that's it's about real? a fart. Yeah, it's about a fart. Are you kidding me? No, it's, it's that is a, for real. I, I won't ask who that is, but it's about a fart. You're in a car, and the person you're with never told a soul. But this is the thing, right? Is the the beauty of songwriting is that you can craft like a a world, right? You'd be like, we're in this emotional, like heavy state, and you can subtly work in a fart joke into <laughs> the an song. emotional song. Yeah. That's it's a nice thing. Well, that's a scoop we have here. We'll call that the pooper scooper. <laughs> well, it wasn't a poop. It was a fart. Just a fart. Just a fart. Just air. Yeah, just air. But can be embarrassing when that is. Was this a date? Uh, it was a an outing of of sorts. A romantic outing with fragrance. Well, listen, I I also everybody farts. It's everybody fine. does. But it is awkward. This is not the conversation I thought we'd be having today, but no. here we are. Well, one thing I have, I always wanted to be the person that would grow old and not talk about ailments. But colon cancer? Yeah. Anything related to farts? Yeah, it's all poop, it's fair game. Condition of the poop. It, it, it's fair game now. You heard it here, folks. You had, it, it's, you know what? Be patient with the elderly. Be patient with those of us that get older because it happens, it happens. and we just talk about it. Shit happens. <laughs> I'm so proud of you, son. And now Thank my you. new moment is that you just threw a pun at me. Yeah. Listen, it's dad life, you know? Dad life, and we love it. Well, this was awesome. Thanks for having I'm me. I'm so happy that you were here. And well, I'm so just when Kevin does it and Frankie does it, just rate us. Let us know who... Who was best? Well, you started with something that I can never confirm or What's deny. That? that I'm your favorite. That's well, well, pretty obvious, but Well, they it's fine. may think, and you may think. Well, it's obvious. <laughs> it's obvious. <laughs> Just ask them. Dad, love you. Thank I love you. you. <sighs> Thank you for being a guest on this thing we're doing here. And Thank you all for listening and watching. Once again, thank you for joining us for Legendary I Lived It, the podcast. Please do subscribe, make sure you follow us, rate where you can, and please do share with your friends. I think you can tell there's a lot of stuff in this that would be great for you to share with others, and I hope it touched you, hope it encouraged you, maybe even made you laugh a little bit. I look forward to sharing with you next time. Many thanks. Bye-bye.